A year ago this week, America saw history in the making when Roe versus Wade was overturned. But since then, we've seen a series of defeats for the pro-life movement. We'll have an assessment today on the Mark Harrington Show about life after Dobbs. Stay tuned. Activist Radio, the Mark Harrington Show, can be picked up by going to markharrington.org. We're also on all the popular podcasting platforms, and you can follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. Well, we are approaching the first uh, anniversary of the overturning of Roe versus Wade. That is the Dobbs v. Jackson case that was handed down by the United States Supreme Court on June 24th of 2022. And so it's appropriate that we here at the uh, the Mark Harrington Show, we, we're going to kind of give an assessment as to what uh, it looks like in a post-Roe America. What's happened since the overturning of Roe versus Wade and Dobbs v. Jackson being handed down by the Supreme Court. So hopefully you can stick around for this. I'm going to get a little bit in the details as far as the uh, political uh, arrangement that's been uh, since Roe v. Wade was handed down, some of the good and some of the not so good. So stick around. Hopefully you'll learn something here and you can use this to kind of set your sights on your own mission to defend the unborn and end abortion. So the first thing is this, uh, you know, last year at this time, I was predicting that uh, the Roe v. Wade decision or the Dobbs decision would come down on Monday, June 27th. So I was off one day, really, because Uh, the weekend and all. And, you know, I was trying to predict, like everybody else, when is the Supreme Court going to hand down the Dobbs decision? Well, it happened on June 24th, not June 27th. But providentially, we were all together at the Day of Action here in Columbus, Ohio, when we got the news about 10 a.m. that Dobbs was handed down and Roe was overturned. So I want to play this clip. It was a great moment for all of us in the pro-life movement that have been working towards this day. Many of them, like myself, have devoted their lives to defend unborn children. So it was a great moment for us to experience together and celebrate as a group. And I just want to play the clip when I announced the uh, decision of the United States Supreme Court. So go ahead and play that. I have an announcement from the United States Supreme Court. Roe is dead. Yeah! Well, that was a that was a great moment. It was a great moment because we got to celebrate together as a group. Our organization created equal along with lots of our other friends here at the Day of Action. And uh, actually, we're going to be having our Day of Action here in a couple of days. And we'll get an opportunity to mark the anniversary of Dobbs v. Jackson and the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's important that we mark this day. It's important that we take a moment and commemorate the historic implications of Roe being overturned. And it's appropriate that we celebrate at some point. But I'll be honest with you, ever since uh, Roe was overturned, we've had a series of defeats in the pro-life movement. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But let me just say this. Uh, when Dobbs was handed down, the United States Supreme Court basically said that there is no right to abortion in the U.S. Constitution. In fact, they went further to say that this is up to the states to decide. And many of us celebrated that. And, and thankfully, it's out of the hands of the Supreme Court. That's a good thing. But the Supreme Court didn't go far enough. And Clarence Thomas was one who pointed that, this out in his opinion, a concurring opinion, because he was one of the six that voted to overturn Roe versus Wade. But he basically went on to say that 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 word person does include the unborn and the Supreme Court should actually, uh, you know, uh, determine that uh, the unborn are persons and protected by the 14th Amendment. So this Dobbs v. Jackson case did not go far enough. And we need to we need to recognize that Uh, we're glad that the Supreme Court's out of the way, but it did not go far enough. And let me read to you the 14th Amendment, which is where we need to focus our eyes on going forward. And it says this, no state shall make or enforce any law 
which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Nor shall any state, and this is the important part, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protections of the law. This is the 14th Amendment. And as Clarence Thomas rightly said, that word person does include the unborn, despite the fact that the other jurists on the uh, Supreme Court did not recognize that. And, And how do we know that? How do we know that? Because prior to the Constitution even being written and the 14th Amendment being adopted uh, in the Bill of Rights, or I'm sorry, as an amendment, Bill of Rights is the top 10, states were already outlawing abortion. So the states at the time recognized that the preborn were persons. Also, the right to abortion is not rooted in American history. It was fabricated, made out of thin air by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1973. And this is what Clarence Thomas basically said. And so it should be for us that we should be uh, continuing to press on and bring cases to the U.S. Supreme Court that would establish or or, or, or recognize the unborn as persons as we understand it in the 14th Amendment. Frankly, we should actually pass a, a, an, a an amendment to the Constitution banning abortion, like Uh, you know, the anti-slavery activists did in the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery. We should be doing that. But having said that, we are where we are, and now it is a state-by-state battle over abortion. And I'll be honest with you, most of the pro-life movement was caught off guard by the overturning of Roe versus Wade, despite the fact that Samuel Alito, uh, his, his opinion, majority opinion, was leaked to the, uh, to the media. Uh, in advance of the uh, decision being handed down. But much of the pro-life movement really didn't know or think that Roe was going to be overturned. So they weren't preparing for next steps. And and, and that's understandable because we had now been working almost 50 years to overturn this egregious decision of the U.S. Supreme Court. And we weren't sure that was even going to happen. We're working so hard to make it happen that we weren't ready for the day after Roe v. Wade was overturned. Uh, So, but it's been a year now. And and friends, let me just say this. It's time to stop celebrating the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Here's why. We can commemorate it, mark it. Uh, It was a big day, of course. But we've been celebrating for over a year. Lots of groups have been doing this. And I don't want to be Johnny Rain Cloud and rain on everybody's parade here and fun. Uh, and say we shouldn't celebrate. We did celebrate. The day after and maybe a few days after that, it was appropriate to do so. But friends, we need to be back to work. And we should have done that a long time ago. Still, we're having these celebrations and galas. And frankly, I don't know that there's a heck of a lot to celebrate right now. We are currently 0 for 6 in state constitutional amendments. Three states have Uh, enshrined abortion up to the very moment of birth. That's California, Vermont, and Michigan. Other states have rejected measures like Montana and Kansas and Kentucky uh, that would have restricted abortion. So we're not doing so good after the overturning of Roe. We need to recognize that and get our act together. Uh, And so, you know, I don't want to get into this too deeply, but the fact of the matter is we celebrated like everybody else. But the next day, we were back to work. And as I said, we are 0 for 6. And now the pro-abortion movement has all their eyes and resources and money focused on Ohio. And I've talked about that at length. And you know that we are, my, we are likely going to be facing a constitutional amendment that's going to be on the ballot here in November that would expand abortion in the state of Ohio up to the very moment of birth. And Ohio is a bellwether. As Ohio goes, so goes the nation. We need to defeat it here in Ohio or else it's going to be sweeping across the nation. Uh, Pro-abortion advocates have already said, telegraphed, that they are going to bring ballot measures in up to 12 states in 2024 uh, during the presidential election. So uh, we got a lot of work to do, friends. uh, And and so we need to get we need to get to work. 
So let me let me just share a couple of facts here when it comes to the the uh, the states. And it, if you would, Mr. Purdue, pop up pop up this uh, this uh, website that has a map. It's an interactive map. If you go to lifesitenews.com, it's at the top, and it, it says 14 states have now banned abortion or something to that effect. And you can go and see the map. And basically, what the map looks like is you have blue states light blue, dark blue, that have either banned abortion or severely restricted it. And then you have the gray states where abortion is basically legal up to the moment of birth. You, you can imagine who those are. And then you have some of that are in the middle. Ohio is one of those where there's pending legisla legislation is being held up by the state Supreme Courts, and um, some of those will likely go into effect. But currently, there are 14 states that have basically banned abortion. And this is great news, friends. So this is great news. That means that women cannot have abortions in these states, surgical abortions for the most part in these states. Does that mean they can't get a pill abortion? In most cases, probably not, because the FDA has loosened the restrictions and women can get these with a Zoom call, possibly uh, go and get a prescription filled at a pharmacy. We know that. We're working to tr try to try to hem that in a little bit, trying to get the FDA to to, uh, to change the laws or, or the rules. And also there's a, 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 uh, a, a, a review of the FDA rules that will likely make its way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and so this is all in flux currently. But for all intents and purposes, there are 14 states that have banned abortion. Uh, there are 16 states that allow a citizen-initiated ballot measure to amend the state constitution. Uh, this is interesting because not all the states in the union allow the constitution to be amended by citizen-initiated measures. Some of them allow it to be amended through uh, actions of the state legislature. Some don't allow it to be amended at all. But of these 10 of the 16 states, uh, there are, they are uh, 10 of them. These are the ones that the pro-abortion folks have focused on. That's Arizona, Arkansas, Florida, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, North Dakota, Ohio, of course, Oklahoma, and South Dakota. Of those 10, there are three that are at the top of the list, and that's Arizona, Ohio, and Florida. And here's why. Because there, these other in Ohio, in 2024, there's going to be ballot measures on the ballot. And they they are doing this because they know those these are swing states for the presidential election. And that's a, a Arizona and Florida. So there are going to be for certain there's going to be a ballot measure on these uh, on the ballot in Arizona and Florida in 2024. And we already know that it's highly likely Ohio is going to have one here in November. Uh, there are 34 states that prevent citizens from initiating constitutional amendments via ballot initiatives. And 15 of those have already put into effect six-week bans or complete abortion bans. So the news isn't all bad. I mean, there's a lot of good news. That is, we're banning abortion in, these, uh, in some of these states and that we have an, a shot at... Um, at preventing bad things from happening in other states. And that's where these six-week bans and others probably will go into effect in the near future. But, but here is the plan of the pro-abortion movement, and that is these constitutional amendments going straight to the people. And unfortunately, there in, are inherently some, some uh, issues or problems with those when it comes to the pro-life effort. We've been really good at uh, changing the laws using the state legislatures over the last 20 years. Representative government is the, you know, is, it was the idea of our founders. Uh, that is that it's not a pure democracy, that it's not uh, one person, one vote. That's, not, that's actually not what our uh, constitution is set up to do. We have representative government. That means we elect representatives who then vote for us to make our laws and policy. Our, our founders were smart enough not to put it up for a vote for all the people because they knew the people could be 
manipulated. And unfortunately, these state constitutional amendments or these direct or democracy uh, efforts uh, favor pro-abortion groups because they can foster a lot of money using big donors and they can simply purchase a constitutional amendment. If they have enough money, they can manipulate enough people, lie to them, in other words, to get them to vote a particular way. Uh, this is why the founders didn't believe in direct democracy. Uh, second, state constitutional amendments can be focused on populated urban areas, like, say, in the state of Ohio, be Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati. They don't have to worry about the uh, rural areas, per se, because if they get enough people in these blue cities to vote a particular way, they win. That's not how it works with representative uh, government, because each each uh, district, whether it be congressional or state legislature, Senate district has the same uh, influence in the state legislature as a district that might be found in a blue city like Columbus, Cleveland or Cincinnati. So, again, the genius of the founders was to not put up everything to a straight vote because they knew that could be manipulated. And thirdly, state constitutional amendments are often won by just saturating the large media markets because of big money. They can buy TV, radio ads, and, and digital marketing, and they can just out, out gun us. You know, they can outfund us. And typically we, we lose the funding battle because these big money interests come in by guys like uh, George Soros, and Michael Bloomberg and, and, you know, Zuckerberg and others. And they just come in, basically saturate the media and social media with their propaganda. Uh, so that's why direct democracy efforts are favorable. That is constitutional amendment efforts are favorable to the left or pro-abortion advocates more than they are uh, to the pro-life movement. So, friends, here in the aftermath of Dobbs, in the overturning of Roe versus Wade, we had a now uh, a year to assess what has taken place. And I can say this. We are basically in a land war, obviously not using guns and tanks and things like that. But we are in a land war. That is that we have this patchwork of pro-life states or, or abortion-free states, if you'd like to put it that way or in abortion havens, uh, where abortion is legal sometimes every, in, up to the very moment of birth. It's similar to the situation that we found ourselves in, in um, during the uh, slavery issue uh, during in, in America, whereas you had slave states and free states, slave states and free states. Uh, and, and it was Stephen Douglas, when he was debating Abraham Lincoln, that said that he was he thought that states should decide on the issue of slavery. Of course, it was Abraham Lincoln who said, no, that is not a good solution to the slavery issue. Uh, it, there has to be a federal remedy. So we understand currently that it is a state by state thing. That is where it is. We're stuck with it. We got to fight that battle now. But that is not where we want this to end, friends. We, we cannot have a divided nation. We cannot have a nation where you have abortion free states where abortion is illegal or severely restricted and then abortion uh, havens where abortion is uh, illegal almost up to the very moment of birth. That is not a final solution for what we're trying to accomplish here. Right. That is not the final outcome. Uh, we're happy that the impediment or the robot block or the barricade, if you'd like to put it that way, of Roe v. Wade is out of the way so we can fight this on a state-by-state -state battle uh, uh, issue. Uh, we're, we're glad for that. But that is not the final uh, destination. The final destination is a federal remedy over abortion, just like there was a federal solution on slavery. So what is that? What What is that uh, final outcome that we want? Uh, well, here, here are the options for us, okay? The first is to have a constitutional amendment to protect the unborn uh, at conception. In other words, we define the word person in a constitutional amendment that would include the unborn. That's number one. However, that is a difficult lift. That is a very hard thing to achieve 
That's why our Constitution has only been amended 27 times. Uh, and it takes two thirds of the Congress to vote for it and three quarters of the states to ratify. We are far off from that ever taking place. But that is one way to get that federal remedy, that federal outcome. The second way is that the U.S. Supreme Court, as I said earlier, would recognize the unborn as persons, as we understand it, in our 14th Amendment. Uh, and, 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 of course, we have one justice right now that agrees with us. Uh, it, you know, I think we're, again, a very long way off from that. I don't know if that will ever happen, but we need to be pushing for it. We need to be pushing for it. And then the third option on a federal uh, level is a congressional ban. That is the House and the Senate pass a law that says abortion is illegal, protects the unborn at conception, and we have equal protection of the laws. Uh, that might be uh, easier, in, despite the fact that we have gridlock in Washington. We're a split country down the line from Democrat to Republican. But, but you understand that these are the three options ahead of us, and we need to be working towards them. And so what is the current strategy? What, or should I say, what, is, what should be the strategy of the pro-life movement going forward in a post-Roe America in the era, era of Dobbs v. Jackson? And I suggest that there are three things we should be doing, three Ps, if you will, the three Ps of our strategy in a post-Roe America. And it is this. The first P is political. We have to be political. Whether we want to or not, our battles are political currently. We're trying to defeat a constitutional amendment here in the state of Ohio. We are fighting a political battle. We've got to defeat this. That means we've got to muster up enough votes to defeat this thing on November uh, 7th if it comes to the ballot. And that's the way it's going to be across the nation. Because win or lose, the pro-abortion uh, movement is going to continue to propose and put up these constitutional amendments. In states like Ohio, marginally, uh, you know, pro-life, pro-life pro states, red states, if you will, uh, they're going to do that. And so we need to defeat them. So we have to have a political strategy to do that. Uh, and, and Ohio is one of the keys to all of this because uh, if just on the presidential side of thing, no president has been elected who has not carried Ohio. Ohio is a bellwether for the country on a lot of things. It's always been a bellwether on the presidential election. It is a bellwether on abortion. If they win in Ohio, they're going to be emboldened to take this all across the nation. So we need to win in Ohio. So our current strategy has to include a political component. Uh, but I would say that over time, this is going to be decreasing because I don't think we have uh, the, uh, the votes, I guess, to say, to, to have a political solution currently. We don't at the federal level, that's for certain. And in a lot of these states, we're, we're, we're not going to win all these constitutional ballot measures. So what we need to be doing is changing hearts and minds. And that's number two. The second P of our current strategy in a post-Roe America needs to be that we are prophetic. That means that we are truth tellers, that we're out educating uh, people, voters primarily, on the truth of abortion, what it does to an unborn child and how it hurts women and how it, it, it destroys a nation for that matter. And we need to be visionary in warning the nation that a nation that kills its children has no future and that God judges nations that shed innocent blood. That needs to be a part of our message. Uh, and so that's what Create Equal does. And we do it very well. We are truth tellers. We are out telling the truth in the public square. Uh, about abortion, using abortion victim photography, by the way, in video. And, and I think others need to be doing that across the country. So that's that's number two. We need to be prophetic. Number one, we need to be political. And then number three, we need to be pragmatic. Uh, you know, I, I know that's a dirty word with a lot of people, being pragmatic. Uh, what I mean by that is we need to prepare for the long run. Uh, we need to be in it for the long game. Uh, this isn't ending overnight. The battle has just begun now for public opinion. And we are behind the eight ball, friends. 
Uh, there's still a solid majority in America that thinks abortion should be legal in the first trimester without limitations. That's about six out of 10 Americans. That's got to change. Uh, and the only way to change that is one on one in conversations, mostly. And that's how it's done. And so we need to be preparing for the long run and be pragmatic. That means we need to have some victories along the way. But we need to uh, you know, marshal our forces together, our resources in states where we can win. That's why I say it's like a land war. A land war, if you think about World War II as an analogy, if you think about how that all started with Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler first invaded the country of Poland in uh, 1939, and then Denmark in 1940, and he started racking up uh, these victories where he occupied, invaded and occupied these countries. And Belgium fell, then North the Netherlands fell, and Luxembourg, and so on. And the Allied forces, rather than continuing to fight in those countries, retreated strategically so that they could fight another day. And so it's true with us. We need to be pulling out, in my view, from states where we have no chance of winning. California, New York, Illinois, for, for example, a lot of the East Coast states, some of the West Coast states. Uh, you know, I know it's difficult to do that, but we need to think in terms of this being a land war and fight where we can win and consolidate our resources and strategically retreat to places where we can hold the line. Ohio is one of those states, friends. And so whether you live in Ohio or not, resources need to be coming into the state, human and financial and otherwise, to fight this battle that is we're looking at on November 7th. We've got to win in Ohio. Uh, in order to to build a, a, a bridgehead, if you will, or beachhead, so that we might be able to take the message to other states. And once we, we, we defend some of these states, then we can go into the states where, uh, you know, we will need to win. You know, in other words, like the Allies did, they consolidated uh, in, in Britain, if you will. The United States invaded, of course, on D-Day. And in the similar thing here, we need to marshal our resources in one place or several places and, and win there, defeat these measures, and then from there strategically launch offensive efforts in states that we can win. So we got to look at it like a land war. I know that the analogy breaks down in some ways because the pro-life movement is not just one army, unfortunately. It's not run by one person or one group. We don't have one general. We don't have our troops under one uh, leader. Uh, so we don't take our marching orders from one. That's, that's part of the problem is that we're fragmented, uh, that we're kind of uh, divided in many regards. And so we, we, we don't think this way. But as, as much as we're able to work together, to unify, to go into these states, like Ohio, I must say, and uh, establish this beachhead, that's what we need to do. That's what we need to do, despite the fact that we have, uh, you know, we do not have one central command, if you will. So that's kind of my assessment of uh, things since Roe versus Wade was overturned uh, a year ago. And, and I exhort you to take a moment Mark the event, commemorate the event. Thank God that it happened, that it, that Roe v. Wade is now out of the way, that an impediment is out of the way. But once you're done with that, let's move on. Let's stop celebrating because we may rue the day that Roe v. Wade was overturned if we start continue to lose these constitutional amendments to the pro-abortion movement. We're 0 for 6 right now. We don't want to go 0 for 7. And we've got 8 to 12 of them possibly in 2024. So we've got a lot of work to do. And friends, if you want to be part of this, you want to join us here at, uh, in Ohio, then go to createdequal.org. That's createdequal.org. Uh, all eyes are on Ohio, friends. And we're, we're looking for help. We need people to help us out. We're looking for help. This is likely going to be on the ballot on November 7 of 2023.
So, friends, I want to bring you up to date on this attack that occurred a couple of weeks ago that I reported on here on the radio, on the program. Uh, at the Planned Parenthood in Baltimore, Maryland, two individuals were brutally beaten, assaulted, Dick Schaefer and Mark Crosby. I talked about it on the show, and I talked about the importance of videotaping. Well, we actually have a videotape. This is taken from the closed-circuit cameras of Planned Parenthood, believe it or not. I guess they were forced to turn it over. Otherwise, I doubt they would have done it. Uh, because this person is still at large. But I want to show this. Here's why. Just to show you what we're faced with on the sidewalks, in the streets of our cities, and sometimes on college campuses. We have people that are unhinged out there, and anything can happen. And I, I am sounding the alarm. If you're a pro-life activist, you better be hunkering down and be pre prepared for the worst, because we are heading into some very perilous times when it comes to defending the unborn. So I'm going to play this again. This is from the Planned Parenthood uh, camera system at the uh, Maryland Planned Parenthood showing this assault. Go ahead and play the clip. It's, it's difficult to watch, by the way. So go ahead and play the clip. Baltimore Police Department Central District Detectives need your help identifying a suspect involved in an assault that occurred on May 26, 2023, around 1020 in the morning in the 300 block of North Howard Street, Surveillance video shows the suspect, a white male with a beard, approaching a group outside the Planned Parenthood building. After a heated conversation, the suspect tackles one of the victims into the ground. Another victim, who came to help, is then assaulted by the suspect. Anyone with information about the incident or the suspect is asked to call Central District Detectives at 410 Three nine six two four. Well, there you go. I mean, pretty brutal. This guy, you know, you know tackles somebody into a planter. And this person was injured, had to go to the emergency room. And then Mark Crosby there, that Senate second individual that came over, uh, is, is taken down and then punched in the face and kicked in the head. And that's why Mark ended up with those with those terrible injuries. And so here's the thing. We're glad that uh, the two uh, Siwa counselors are back on the street doing their work. But the bottom line is this. We have people out there that this is no big deal to them. Uh, they think he can get away with it. This guy even did so far. He's eluded justice. Uh, but but we got to understand that anybody that comes up who's hostile to us or sometimes not even hostile can be a threat, physical threat to us. And we need to be having our heads on a swivel that is constantly be looking for individuals like this. It's called profiling, friends. And we need to make sure we have a good distance between us and them. And we need to be uh, videotaping. That means wearing a GoPro or some other kind of videotape, whether it's on a tripod nearby or what. And I don't care, friends, if you're concerned that this will turn away women from going into the abortion center if you're wearing a, a GoPro camera, a body camera. The fact of the matter is we have never experienced that at Planned Parenthood. When we counsel, we wear GoPros. People don't, the, the women going inside, the men that go inside, they don't care that we're wearing these. Uh, and if they do and they want to talk to us, I just simply say, I'm going to turn it down or turn it off. And then I talk to them and then I turn it back on. Right. But these cameras can save your life. Uh, not only are they a deterrent to those who might think about doing something to you like this individual. Who knows if this guy would have seen someone wearing a camera, he might have not he might have thought, thought twice about doing this. Plus, it can be used to bring them to justice. Now, thankfully, there's a video here. Uh, and of course, right now, we don't, this person is not brought to justice, but video is important. In fact, if you don't videotape it, most people don't think it ever happened. They're not going to believe you. So, again, I'm going to make this offer. If you are an activist, if you sidewalk counsel or you go out on the streets and, uh, and do uh, pro life outreach, I'm offering you a GoPro at no charge. If you can't afford it, I'll send it to you free of charge. Just go to createdequal.org and message us or go to markharrington.org and let me know and I'll send you a GoPro for free if you don't or can't afford it. We cannot be out on the sidewalks without videotaping. Bottom line, we have to be doing that. I feel very strongly about it. Years ago, we made this decision to start wearing them and I guarantee you that it's probably deferred, uh, deterred a lot of people from acting out uh, violently against us. So that's all I got for you today.
God bless you. God bless America. And remember, America, to bless God. You've been listening to Mark Harrington, your radio activist. For more information on how to make a difference for the cause of life, liberty, and justice, go to createdequal.org. To follow Mark, go to markharringtonshow.com. Be sure to tune in next time for your marching orders in the culture war.